Good evening. Hello. Welcome. Nice to see you all. Thanks for coming. I'll just start, uh, importantly, to acknowledge that we are on Aboriginal land uh, and that sovereignty has never been ceded. This is Wurundjeri Woiwurrung country, all of it, the land, the sky, the waters, the ground. Um, it's part of this Kulin nation whose people have cared for this country for many, many thousands of years and continue to do so today. Uh, and I'd like to pay my respects to those elders past and present uh, and to acknowledge any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be here this evening. My name's Rory Hyde. I'm Associate Professor in Architecture here at the Melbourne School of Design, University of Melbourne. Uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this public lecture by Paul Karakusevich, titled The Social, the Dwelling, the Estate. I'll introduce Paul. Paul Karakusevich is the founder of Karakusevich Carson Architects, whose purpose is to raise the architectural design standard and ambition for the UK's social and public housing. Over the past 20 years, he has worked alongside residents and local government to create dwellings that give residents dignity and help to improve quality of life and chances for future generations. The studio has completed 10 major London council housing projects, for which they've been widely awarded and widely published. Uh, at present and uniquely, the whole studio is engaged in public work. Paul is a co-author of a number of books, including Social Housing, Definitions and Design Exemplars, and Public Housing Works, which is a um, brilliant catalogue of their work over the last 20 years. I came to know Paul when we were both uh, design advocates for the Mayor of London, and Dan was one of those as well. Uh, and it's my great pleasure to welcome him here to the MSD. Please welcome Paul to <laughs> Uh, good evening, everyone. It's a, an honour to be here. I think I was here five years ago uh, when I felt decidedly younger. But great to see you all. I think it was actually in the summer holidays, so so um, there were more um, more people from practice than students. But uh, great great to be back in the city. Uh, had a super few days. So I'm going to talk um, a little bit about the 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 context that we're working in, the history of, of public housing um, in in London and the the UK. Uh, a little bit about the process of the studio, and then talk through some of the projects we are working on, uh, both completed and uh, in evolution. So a little bit about the studio. So for the people maybe who are graduating uh, this year, I graduated in a, in a huge uh, financial recession in 1995 from the Royal College of Art. Um, and then uh, I think I sent out four CVs and uh, managed to get a job offer with Zaha Hadid uh, when the studio there was about 10 people um, and uh, was able to work on the Cardiff Bay Opera House, which is an amazing project. But uh, after a year and a half of that, I thought it was probably time to start looking outside of that studio and start setting up uh, by myself, which was, um, from a business perspective, a rather crazy, crazy idea. Somebody did take pity on us uh, two or three years into that process and um, actually offered us this project to the bottom uh, left, which is Claredale Street, uh, which is an amazing, uh, well, was an amazing uh, community housing uh, association in East London, and they gave us our first first big break. Um, and gradually, we've built up a portfolio of, um, as Rory mentioned, just working with local councils and uh, one or two carefully selected uh, community housing associations. So, all scales, um, key criteria, client ambition a process which is resident focused always and um, scale less important, more, more about the, the interest and the complexity and the ambition of, the, of each individual project. So we're circa 75 people at the moment. Everyone obviously applies to the studio to come and work on social and public housing projects, which is great. And within that, we've got a, a lovely uh, research department, an uh, in-house historian, um, and then three or four others are uh, writing essays uh, regularly and, and publishing. Uh, we've also got an in-house model shop, not quite as fancy as yours here, and no robots, but three full-time model makers um, who uh, every, every single project is developed through millions of sketches and lots and lots of models, um, and then gradually evolves into the, uh, um, into the scheme. In our, our former office, we had this amazing hub space, not quite as, as grand as this one, but... Uh, that we use for in-house talks, but also uh, guest guest lectures as well. So we sort of create, try to create a real culture and buzz 
around the subject. I think 20 years ago, no one wanted to talk about public housing. No one knew about social housing. But gradually, we've, uh, and with one or two others and some of our amazing clients, elevated that discussion uh, a little bit. Um, so more people are now engaged in the, in the debate. Examples here for some of the exhibitions in New York and in London of our work and that of others. So uh, this was London's first uh, council estate, the Boundary Estate, which is just around the corner from our office in, in Shoreditch. It was an amazing uh, master plan and then a collection of uh, circa 20, 20 buildings, uh, one lead architect, and then lots of people working in, in their team. Uh, this was a key piece of policy uh, 105 years ago uh, that gave rise to the first uh, public housing program in the UK. Um, and. Uh, has been running pretty much ever since uh, with a 27-year break uh, around the time of Margaret Thatcher, unfortunately. We've had a fair, you know, there's, I think there's always been a, supposedly there's always been a housing crisis in the UK since 1919 and, and lots of uh, protests. Uh, and each time there's a protest, there's a, a call for action and um, leads to new policy and um, new agendas from government and from local, local councils. Uh, historically, we were quite good at building uh, public housing, you can see here, 1953, 200,000 plus homes per year, which is amazing. A lot of them factory produced, uh, some of them beautifully designed, some of them uh, beautifully designed but badly built, um, which a uh, very familiar story to um, that of uh, Melbourne and uh, other other big uh, cities based on, on the sort of that had large uh, public housing programs. Across the whole industry in the UK, that was what we were building. It's now a quarter of that. Um, there have been highlights uh, and some low low moments. This is a Roman point. This is a panelized system tower that uh, partially collapsed. Um, uh, this was an amazing, there's a film about Coin Street, uh, the community initiative uh, to build truly affordable homes um, on a site. Um, interesting that Richard Rogers was uh, meant to be designing for a big uh, property investor in London. Um, and the local residents fought it and fought it. And, um, the mayor of London at the time um, of the GLC, Ken Livingston and others, uh, decided to go with this idea and allow a community builder to build um, on one of the key sites in, in South London for, um, on the South Bank for those that haven't been. Unfortunately, Margaret Thatcher terminated all public housing programs and cut all investment into social and public housing. Um, and 20 or so years later, that is what the UK was building in terms of affordable housing. So um, from a very high peak to a, to a, a record low of production for council housing. In, in that time, housing associations were building some, but not enough by, by any means. Hence, now we, why we have a, a major crisis of numbers and, and quality. Grenfell, probably the, the, the sort of a legacy of poor design, poor construction, poor management, Everything that could go wrong in the construction industry did, and the the legacy of that is is, is obviously we're still feeling that uh, around the world. Uh, but it is leading to new new policies about quality and management, which is fabulous. Um, this is what Shelter, who's uh, the UK's big uh, homelessness charity, estimate is is what we need to be building. So, a few few words and a bit of a word word salad of of, of what we're. Uh, discussing really on a daily basis, weekly basis, with the dis our architects in the studio, our clients and our residents. I won't pick on them, you, you can read them, but it's how, I, th I think a lot of people think housing is very simple, you just go off and build, build something, but uh, building public housing is, is quite challenging from a, um, a resident perspective, from a, a land perspective, from um, a funding perspective from a management perspective and all of these things have to go into the process in order to get successful uh, schemes and then uh, make sure the legacy of that project is as, as great as it can be through through good management. So I'm going to rattle through some some projects. I've, I've included lots of drawings, lots of uh, process models to, to show how we've we've worked and also examples of some of the resident engagement we've done. Uh, for me it's really key that residents are front and center of any process um, and luckily we've avoided working on projects where the councils or the housing associations have got that balance wrong and um, it's been, been more of a top-down or developer-led process. Uh, we've always worked with the council on a, this sort of resident-led um, uh, ground-up uh, process, which has been, uh, I think, part of the success of the schemes. This is the Colville Estate. That's our very first office uh, was in the wing of this warehouse here uh, when 
this part of East London, Shoreditch, was uh, incredibly cheap. Um, and we'd been watching the estates here, this little big uh, conglomeration of Hackney housing estates here in, in North East London uh, for several years and, and wondering why uh, underutilized land on the estate was not being used. To, to that, at that point, it was the dot-com boom. And we were pr pr promoting ideas to the council uh, about how they could use underutilized car parking, bin compounds and various other things dotted around the edge of the, uh, the estates. Uh, they thought we were crazy. Eight years later, we walked into an interview for the, exactly the projects that we'd promoted eight years earlier. So for any young, young practitioners or young architects in the studio, it is worth knocking on doors. It might take a while for the door to open or for the, a response to come back, but as a, as a way of developing uh, work and, and ideas, as it, it did work. The uh, old estates uh, look like this. Outwardly, not the worst housing in London by any means, but inwardly, the residents were incredibly dissatisfied with the conditions. They were living in damp, cramped, small rooms, uh, bad light, and, you know, having to, you know, this was the experience of the public realm. And they'd been pushing Hackney for 15 years to rebuild, either refurbish or rebuild um, their estate. Uh, the, their priority was to essentially all get a new house or a new flat um, as swiftly as possible. So examples here, we think we've met the residents over 300 times, amazingly committed group, and they've worked from every step of the master plan, the evolution of the urban design framework, the, the individual design of the blocks, through to the cores, through to the lobbies, through to their individual dwellings. So some of the, um, these aren't our drawings on the top left, this was for a, a kids, kids uh, coloring workshop of one of the, one of the drop-ins. But the, the parents and, and the residents on the right were, were incredible and absolutely in, instrumental. Some of them have been involved now for over 30 years in, in moving the project uh, forward and keeping um, the council absolutely focused on quality and um, ambition. So examples here of the, of the early design moves of the master plan, creating better connectivity, uh, better walking, pedestrian routes, uh, cycling, uh, connections to the park, leisure center school and up to the canal to the north and because of the funding at the time was incredibly meager so the, this was a hackney council as the, our client as the landowner as the as the building owner of, of beginning to operate as a social developer which was the really the first time at scale a london council had done this um once they'd been given new powers by gordon brown in 2007 so this was a sort of pioneering council and a very much a pioneering project so examples here of the evolving streetscapes, uh, we wanted a street-based response. Uh, the residents felt uh, comfortable with that. They, they liked the idea of brick uh, buildings made from brick and generally with a lower to mid-rise uh, townscape and, and urban framework. Examples of the sketches, some, some for community engagement, just some we endlessly pin up on our walls just to, to, to review the, the evolving uh, designs. So trying to create always uh, streets with, with a sense of pride and quality, uh, lobbies with, which give dignity to the residents coming in and out of their homes, and then dwellings that are uh, as generous as possible. We sometimes fall out with our clients for being a little bit too generous, but uh, we think it's important and we want the, the housing that we're designing to last ideally hundreds of years. Uh, we don't want to be involved in projects that are being removed after 30, 40, 50 years. It's uh, clearly not sustainable. So this is the uh, phase two. The residents was interested in, well, every, every aspect, um, the, the replacement shops, the ground floors, the, obviously their replacement homes are obviously a priority, the quality of the landscape, and also the market sale buildings that help to, to cover the cost of everything. Early on, we realized that most people don't understand architectural drawings, so we, we've got into the habit of drawing these big, really large scale um, sketches that people can get involved in and see exactly what they're, how the evolving framework, mass plan framework is looking, how the public spaces are working, where their buildings are, how the buildings are configured, uh, where the green spaces and landscape are. And then sort of a study here of, of, of taking a, you know, a very simple block from the, from the framework and then evolving it through a range of types, massing, scale, uh, amenity, density, and through to the finished designs. So. And this project's already almost 15 years old. It's had a few stops and starts because of funding, procurement, local government policies and various other things, but it's, we're about halfway through the project now. Um, so for people who haven't 
done a housing unit or a studied housing yet at a university. We're, we're always trying to, for example here, create uh, homes with, with double aspect. Uh, it's great for ventilation, good for light. Orientation is key, so we're always trying to optimize the orientation. Obviously it's reversed because we're in the Northern Hemisphere. So, so lower, lower edges here, getting as much daylight and sunlight into the gardens as, as, as possible. And then accenting the corners uh, where we can to create additional density and additional homes. And then these are sort of the evolve, evolving drawings. These were drawn in CAD many years ago, probably nearly 10, eight years ago, maybe. Uh, we're now working a lot in Revit in the later stages, but always, always hand-drawn initially and modeled initially and working through every single cheek of every facet, every, every soffit, every corner, every terrace lining to make sure everything is thoroughly designed, costed, put into planning, secured through planning, and then uh, developed out in more detail through the tender process and then through to the finished building. So the, 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 our client Hackney took this all the way through to uh, tender um, and then through, um, we call it sophisticated design and build where the architects are drawing every single detail, every specification note, and then handing over to a contractor to actually build. Uh, they still have a tiny bit of flexibility over how they construct it, but every, every aspect of the quality of the building is defined through that um, detailed design stage. And this is Hackney as, as you know, 10 years ago. So we were able to, as, because they were capturing all of the value of the, of the project, uh, we were able to specify very, very high quality public raw materials, landscape materials, but also uh, building fabric as well, bricks, uh, solid bricks, um, I have to point out, high quality timber and oak and everything else, uh, all the way through the skin. And then through to the dwellings, amazing amenity, double aspect, uh, great views, lovely big terraces. Uh, lots of dwelling types, always trying to mix the, the homes as much as possible so there's as many living uh, dwelling types, uh, lifestyles as possible from one beds to two beds to three beds, different configurations of family homes up to four and five bedrooms, creating spaces for homework, different lifestyles, extended families, and uh, really to try and meet the housing need of the residents. Um, so again, the, the residents were actively involved in exactly the, the design of their dwelling and how it, how it was going to be uh, produced and where it would sit in the building, uh, which sometimes gave us a few headaches with uh, stacking of columns, uh, servicing and other, other issues, but we, we gradually worked through it. And then these are the construction drawings or, or, or very late uh, tender drawings. And so taking them all the way through as a, as a process, there were probably about 400 detailed GAs, uh, detailed sections, and, and details for a, a building of this size. So as a young, young graduate architect, this is probably what you might be doing if you're working in a studio doing residential. Lots of this, uh, this type of drawing, uh, working out every single corner, drawing it up carefully, making sure it all works. Uh, example here of the, of the lower maisonette here, that f has its own front door, bike storage, uh, entrance space, that falls over, has its own little patio that then spreads out into the, spills out into the communal garden. And then a separate doorway and staircase goes up to the upper maisonette, which has two lovely terraces, one looking over the street, one looking over the, over the, over the garden. So in reality, uh, it was designed in cross laminated timber. We had a big thing about cross laminated timber about 15 or 20 years ago. We were designing everything in CLT. Unfortunately, the, at the time, the building industry didn't like CLT and our, our client got cold feet at the last minute. So he had to redesign everything in concrete, which it's, it's fine. It's, it's going to be there for a long time. So I can, I can uh, rational, rationalize the, the, the carbon content of the concrete because the, the homes will be there for so long. And then uh, inside again. And then in the, in the corner here, we had to, this was the, the old uh, bin compound and recycling compound for the estate. And um, under here was an underground car park. And the residents were, were so involved, they were fully aware of the financial modeling behind the project, how the project was funded. At the time, the scheme was about 150 million pound uh, project. It's now 300 million pounds because of inflation and time has passed. But obviously at the time, the council didn't have 150 million pounds to go and spend on a rebuilding all of the estate. So that's why it had to be phased. And we identified this corner here that could be used as a high density 
uh, market sale, revenue generating uh, project, which we, in the end, seven or eight years later, collaborated with David Chipperfield on to design as a sort of true collaboration and then build build this scheme out. Um, so two very sculptural, taller buildings, 16 and 20 stories, completely in the round sort of entrance <coughs> lobby here and here, um, and then creating this natural gateway into the estate and vice versa from the estate into the into the park. Also working with Vought, who are amazing uh, landscape architects as well on the, on the public realm around the, the base of the two buildings. So this is probably from competition stage, a million models. Gradually the hexagonal form came, came about because of lots of underground services and uh, drainage and uh, mains, cables and gas pipes and everything else. And also one of the residents in the first phase had just moved into his flat, uh, Mike, and was a little bit worried that the taller building might take, he, was, he used to get up very early, and he took a photo at about 5.15 um, of the sunlight coming into his new flat, and he was worried that the, the big buildings that we were making across the street would actually take his light uh, at that time in the morning. So we, the whole project is actually shaped around getting light into his flat and, and his neighbours so they would get their sort of May, early May, uh, you know, sunrise moment uh, into there. Um, so this, that's, that started the sort of the chamfering and the sculpting of the, of the buildings. So the evolution drawings, um, we had, I think, two people, two of our young associates at the time on the project and one very young guy from David Chipperfield's office, uh, a young, young architect called Dean Pike, who was amazing as well. And uh, the three of them sort of developed the whole, the whole design. He's now got his own office. So ex examples here in the plan. So we don't, it means it's, to, to show this to a commercial client uh, would probably elicit a, a rather negative reaction. Um, but our client at the time at Hackney was incredibly ambitious and sort of went, went, with, the, went with the journey and we, we were on a very sort of, we, we've got um, London mayoral standards, uh, minimum sp space standards, and to, unfortunately, the minimum standards become the maximum because that's just the way, the way things are. So we had to sort of create a scheme which was pretty much hitting all of the numbers, all of the metrics to make it, to make it work financially and support the rest of the project. Uh, but we were able to create these lovely double aspect, two beds, and then that nests then with a one bed carve these big balconies into each apartment and then the living rooms have this great double aspect. Kitchens tucked in here, bathrooms here, bedrooms then in this outer outer ring. Uh, we were again able to convince the client to put all of the all of the a bit of parking, bike stores, bin compounds and everything else downstairs, which then allowed us to have this lovely through uh, ground floor. And then lots of testing of the brickwork. Uh, we used um, a Belgian brick, uh, Van der Mortel one type which is the red one and through lots of color testing we were able to use that once um, on one building and then the other building the brick was cooked twice and it became gray so we have a, a gray building and a red building but it's the same brick and then an example here from from site of the concrete uh, core going up with the stairs and the lifts inside and then the floor plates being created and and formed with the steel. It was one of our young architects at the time, inspecting. And then you could see the sequencing of the brickwork going up and then the, gradually the windows as well being fitted. So the, there was, a, I think, a, a degree of competition between that team and that team, seeing who, who could uh, get, get their building up uh, quickest. Um, but we were involved all the way through, so there was a lot of checking, a lot of, a lot of rigour in the, in the process. Uh, that's the bike and car, little car ramp spiralling down. I think we drew every single cobble and the builders almost laid every single cobble as per as per drawing and then uh, completed the lovely big wraparound uh, balconies with these incredible views across the whole of London. Um, based on the success of that project we were then um, awarded another one by Hackney which was amazing, the King's Crescent uh, master plan which had had three failed attempts to, to rebuild or refurbish over the preceding 10 years. Uh, it's fair to say the residents were not very happy with the council uh, they were very dissatisfied about the conditions and we were given this uh, opportunity to, to look at a new framework, a new master plan and then work out how um, each of the phases could come forward. And again, we had a slightly different team in, in the council, but uh, really sort of design-led, resident-led and um, 
gradually we got to a, a master plan and a scheme that was financially viable and, and worked from a complete position of distrust because you can imagine living in conditions like this a lot of these windows were boarded up and then people living upstairs terrible conditions downstairs lots of antisocial behavior lots of drugs and vice and everything else despite that within a few meetings we were able to talk to the residents and really actively involve them in the in the design process uh, i think that was the first sketch um which is almost identical to the to the to the master plan it went through about 300 evolutions but uh, the core principles were there of the of the the connection from the sort of the neighborhood here all the way through to the park and then wrapping the new buildings and and sort of making them kiss the old ziggurat of um, 1960s uh, six-story buildings around the edge so we looked at how we could refurbish the existing buildings without any displacement obviously and and also how the residents could stay in situ as much as possible we created refuges for them during the day when the noisy works were going on and uh, we spent about £100,000 per dwelling to refurbish. At the time, the council couldn't afford to rehouse people and obviously rebuild because that's a very expensive exercise. And the buildings are, are, are structurally sound and, and, and solid. So uh, it seemed like a, 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 a good one to keep um, and then stitch in the new buildings and the new spaces around them. So this is what the residents have been living with here, a rather sort of dystopian landscape. And the sort of buildings, the existing buildings wrap all the way around, you can see here. So we created this new network of, of streets, building spaces, evolution, again, millions of sketches. A landscape workshop, this was um, uh, Liza Fior and Muff Architect, Muff Landscape Architects worked with us on the public realm and um, landscape design, which has, has come out really, really well. So we've got a new, a new play street all the way through here, so play on the way, and then uh, a sort of an active edge all the way around the buildings of, of uh, threshold of sort of transition from the public realm into a um, front front yards and front terraces and then into people's apartments and dwellings. Evolving sketches of, of uh, all the phases and again sort of very simple framework diagrams that we can communicate to residents about where the where the tall buildings are, where the key moments are, where the connections are, where the spaces are, where the, where the amenity spaces i think having lived in that you can imagine living in a in a site that was full of rubble for so long to be discussing where the place spaces are where the gardening clubs are um where the play on the way street is and then how the, all the buildings are configured was, would have been very exciting for the residents and this is uh so the the overall uh master plan here and then this is phases three and four which are just going on site at the moment this is phases one and two, uh, one of our in-house models. And then uh, this is block one of phase one, which is this one here, which is social, 100%. So you have social rent is the uh, most affordable government rent level. And then the middle building is a combination of social and intermediate. And then the majority of this one, a key worker and market sale, which helps to pay for everything else. And then the existing buildings are predominantly social rent exists. So they're all of the existing residents. Um, stayed there and then everyone shares these nice gardens which is not universal we found we're working in Toronto and some other places and that's not normal um, often there's a segregation of, of tenants from one tenure to another but Hackney being a right-minded sensible pragmatic moderately left-wing council said that's unacceptable we have to have all the residents sharing spaces both private and and communal so this is a sketch just showing the building configuration of the cores generally go at the corners because it's the most efficient place to, to, uh, to, to insert a staircase and, and lifts. Um, you'll notice a lot of our buildings only have one staircase. That is now changing. Everything is going to two staircases over 18 meters, which means the cores get a little bit bigger. And then we're wrapping all of the ground floors where we can with active uses just to create better streets and a better uh, ground floor experience. We've finished. We were able to justify just uh, the having inboard balconies and, and uh, amenity spaces rather than bolting things on the outside of the buildings. Bolting on the outside is much cheaper. Embedding them is more expensive because you're essentially building three times the wall surface. But again, ambitious client, design focused. We were able to, to convince them that that would lead to a better, calmer, outward public realm and, and quality, quality building. And then the upper 
apartments, which is sort of more family-sized, uh, three bedrooms, have this amazing double-height lodger that wraps all the way around the top of the, the building. Lots of facade studies, lots of models, got some beautiful sort of huge models, sort of this big in, this, in the studio. Um, that we made partly for our own design process. We even made one for the builders, so they couldn't say it was an expensive or, or overly, compli overly complicated facade because they were obviously building it on a budget. So we had to prove to them that it was very simple to do. And then um, example here of the one of the brickwork uh, packages. So we have a seven-stage process from start to completion, and this this is now would be a, a stage four. So the end of the design process. With the residents and the clients, a lot of specification workshops, a lot of discussions over materiality, qualities, and what works well together, what's going to be easily maintained, how, how it can be built. So we're using a lot of Peterson Tegel uh, bricks, which are very beautiful Danish brick manufacturer. So solid, solid brickwork, and then a lot of precast elements for the lintels and, and special, special features in the building. So an example here, cutting through the upper maisonettes. So a gallery access on this side, and then the private I mean, space on this side with the living rooms uh, spilling out onto that. And then building as much generosity as possible, big terraces where, wherever we can, sitting on the shoulders of the buildings and wrapping around and sort of embedded into the, into the body of the building. And then the refurb. So we were able to, to dig down where the garages were, create in this phase uh, 14 hidden homes on the lower level. And then we added uh, winter gardens, uh, wider um, deck access, uh, new lifts, new roofs, more insulation, uh, new servicing. So we're, the residents of, in the existing homes also got a, a very big uplift in the quality of their uh, dwelling and, and lived experience. And then this is um, part, part of the play on the way street with a lovely community table that sits. So Liza described this as a street interrupted. You can so you get it from the graphics of the interrupted street markings and then this community table that I think this photo was in the middle of COVID, so it was a bit empty. But on a, on, a, on a sunny May day, then this is very incredibly well used. And then this um, active play, big rocks, logs, hammocks and things stitched in. And then an example of one of the lobbies, so very high, well, as high as we could possibly make and justify. Uh, glazed brick, solid materials, easy, easily maintained, but giving a dignity. And then examples of the landscape. Views down in, in real life. And then a very different scale. So this was for Enfield Council, uh, right to the north, one of the poorest wards in, in London. Enfield at the time had not built anything for 40 years. And we were given this very, very narrow strip of land to rehouse people from this tower that was being demolished. That wasn't anything to do with us. That was a sort of a, another process going on. But we were asked to do the rehousing project here. And from the beginning, it, it doesn't look very promising as a form of gas works, sandwiched between an industrial estate, sub uh, suburban gardens, allotments, quite nice and a new school that was being built here. The, so this was an exercise of, of how we could create as many homes as possible in a very, very tightly constrained site. So we looked at the, the site wasn't wide enough to create an equal uh, and balanced street with, with the same type on both sides. So we had to be quite inventive with, with the two key, key types, which are here, and then on the other side of this end, uh, which where we were able to double up, have a have a lower courtyard family flat and then an upper maisonette in in a in a five point I think five point six meter wall to wall party wall to party wall so it looks like a single house but there's actually two dwellings inside and then these sort of wide shallow units embedding a little car parking space with a terrace on top um, so very wide incredibly shallow and then right on the school boundary so we had to a lot of negotiations with the headmistress over what was appropriate regarding overlooking and or not overlooking, screening, rear yards and all of these things. Lots of sketches we worked with East on the public realm, who uh, at the time were very good public realm architects. So carefully designed, incorporating a little bit of parking um, and creating uh, what what is sort of we, we call a London Muse street. So in suburbia that's wouldn't you wouldn't normally have a muse, but we convinced the planners that a muse would allow a, a double-sided street so people weren't looking on this side of the road, weren't looking at a, um, a school fence on the other. So we created this little, little neighbourhood inside. 
these are the planning drawings upstairs, and then one of our nice models. So this is the courtyard, two bedroom flat downstairs, and then the staircase up to the family maisonette. And then in sort of animated, in, in uh, showing the, how you could occupy the space. So these would have been shown to the residents uh, early on. Uh, we had a lot of dialogue with the residents over e e each of these, because they, they're slightly unconventional dwelling types, but are we you're sort of explaining how, how those dwellings might be used? And then in, in reality, a little sort of courtyard and patio, living room, and then the sort of new street, sort of enclosed nicely, sort of bounded on every side, um, a contained uh, mini mini neighbourhood, which the residents absolutely love. Um, so the in the section, this is a sort of lobby lobby here, uh, kitchen, uh, living room, so one and a half high and high living room spilling out onto the terrace, and then bedrooms so again, the upper bedroom having a little bit more volume, which is quite rare in the UK. There, there's a uh, there can be a meanness, and there's often a, a you know, public housing is, is often cost consultants, QSs, as we call them, uh, and builders can, if they get involved in the design early, can squash things. Um, and again, we were able to argue the value of doing something a little bit different and special and give the residents the highest quality of life. So example, millions of examples of sketches, construction drawings. This was also designed in CLT. And again, the clients got cold feet right to the last minute, which is a real shame. Um, <clears throat> but everything else, pretty much the brickwork and the and the roof roofing and the detailing was all all kept. Size of the windows, examples of the bricks. So this was an English brick from the uh, Lake District, uh, Finesse. It's a beautiful um, UK uh, manufacturer, all hand laid, all beautifully done, detailed, and and uh, executed well. We found that brick brick layers or brickies actually quite appreciate complex, more complex designs and uh, just so they're not doing the standard, the standard bond all the way through every scheme. So uh, we had quite a good, a lot of fun with this one and staggering and recesses and um, depth to the walls and window reveals um, and then also incorporating the glazed brick as well. In reality, this is the upper the living room spilling out onto the terrace. Very happy residents. Happy cyclists, because we also included a, a bike route that came through. So sort of connecting neighborhoods together again. And we even made a little play space and waiting space for the kids being dropped off at school. This is probably one of our, our sort of very special projects at the moment, the Selby Urban Village, another ch quite challenging ward in London. And the the Selby Centre grew out of um, a big housing estate, uh, the Broadwater Farm, which I'll talk about in a second, in the 1980s. And they've run this incredible community centre um, for the last uh, three decades in an old school building, in a, in a school building that was um, a secondary school that wasn't being used. So they set up this incredible community building, community spirit. And 30 years on, the school building is really on its last legs. So they have they were talking to the council about how they could do um a, a co-lead a project with the council to build a new all singing, all dancing uh, community building um, and 200 affordable homes as well on the on the site of the old school. So this is the this is the old school here. Uh, so this is the northern fringe of of um, central London. The inner ring road is just just north of here. So it's about nine miles out of central London. So quite deprived surrounded by industry, hospitals, edge of suburbia. And these are the conditions that have been running. Hundreds and hundreds of people attend the building every day. Charities, local businesses, but in quite tired conditions. We did look at a refurb um, strategy, but it, was, it would have been twice as expensive as a new build, so obviously not very clever. And here are examples of the workshop. Um, this was Sahana, the project architect on the job, working, sort of visioning with the charities and the, and the stakeholders in the building, developing a brief uh, very early on in the, in the process. Uh, COVID happened at some point, so we had to do then all, the, all of this online during COVID, sort of evolving uh, framework sketches, and then lots of these sort of models to sort of, in a way, developing the, the, the brief in 3D with the, with the center and the, and the stakeholders. In the early early parts of the project, we're not too proud about what we're, you know, it can be very rapid 
uh, you know, detailed paper type drawings for us pinned up on the wall, modeled, and then gradually they, they, they go through the, the stages. I'm trying to get the young architects in the office not to use the computer in the early, early parts of each design process, just to stick with sketches and models until it's all signed off, which is not always successful. But I'm sure while I've been away the last two weeks, they've all been sitting at their computers again, crashing away in Revit. Uh, but I, I like the sort of very tactile nature of drawing and making models and uh, developing that, that process. So this is um, the evolving uh, framework and the emerging Selby Center building here overlooking the park. So this was a very early, early sketch of, of how we could use the circulation spaces and the foyers as flexible uh, breakout space, probably not dissimilar to some of the spaces outside in, in your building. I think we've probably designed this building about six times, uh, all, all for one fee, but it's, it's, it's been quite a, quite a challenge for, from a funding perspective. Uh, but we were very lucky. Um, about six months ago, we got 20 million pounds from central government, um, which was quite remarkable that the government would be interested in a project like this in, in a ward of, uh, in a council, uh, like Haringey. That 20 million pound injection has sort of transformed the, the, the process in the last few months. So we're now, um, developing a, a version of this scheme, um, to uh, get it into detailed planning and then on site uh, next year. So evolving sketches and designs and then the wider neighborhood. So quite mid-rise, quite calm, has to be built on a real, a real budget. Uh, the, the, it's 100% affordable housing. Um, so we're looking at five, six, seven stories, so keeping it sens simple, sensible, really pragmatic street and block structure. Um, good, great unit types very generous, but the, the architecture has to be quite calm. And then we're focusing a lot of the time, time sort of energy on the entrances, lobbies, uh, galleries, and the, obviously the Selby Centre itself. And then Broadwater. This is maybe not quite as complex as some of the projects uh, I've been reading about in the, in the press in, in Melbourne, but it's a 1960s estate in Haringey in North London, designed by the architects department, built using a Swedish panelized um, system that has had some structural problems over the years. And um, post Grenfell, all of the councils had to go and inspect all of their buildings to make sure they were fire safe. Um, while they were doing that, they discovered that a lot of the buildings also had structural problems. So this building and this tower had quite bad structural problems as well as all of the poorly uh, renovated work from the 90s that was obviously a, a fire risk as well. So these, these two buildings have had to come down. Uh, the residents were moved out you know, very in close proximity, but they had to move moved out in an emergency. And we've been looking for about four years at, at how we could refurbish and retrofit the wider estate. We looked at a pilot for these two projects here, and then a master plan framework of how we could stitch the estate back together with new buildings. So drawings here won lots of awards. Um, the architectural historians of the room will, will see the sort of streets in the sky, everything raised up. It was on marshland, so everything was raised up on Pilotti by five or six meters. There were troubles and, and riots in the in the eighties. And if anyone knows sort of Alice Coleman, she inspired Thatcher and a lot of her thinking of about urbanism and and um, how you make a, a neighborhood. Um, and clearly this was not in her textbook of, of how you make a neighborhood. So a lot of these walkways were, were disconnected. So, so in the eight, late eighties and nineties, it became, uh, quite a depleted place. And the residents were obviously not particularly happy, uh, about living there. Despite that, there was a very strong community spirit. So this is, this is, uh, the, the type of the condition of the estate. Now it's not been great. It's not had its management regimes in place. We seem to be given all of these challenging projects to try and try and fix over a decade or so. So again, emerging diagram, we, we also discovered there's a, a massive culvert running through here, which meant the environment agency in terms of water wouldn't allow us to build on that. So we suddenly had to redesign the entire master plan uh, around a diagonal movement, which is quite difficult because triangular buildings are harder to, to resolve. We also had to protect a mural here, uh, which has uh, just become locally listed. So again, how you do you do a retrofit and protect big artworks like that is quite quite a challenge. And then evolving studies, working with a youth group on the estate, 
They helped with all the engagement events with the older residents. We've got two amazing engagement uh, managers in the studio, Hajir and Morgan, who worked with all of the young women on the estate uh, and worked on a program called Making Space for Girls, uh, Safe Spaces for Girls. Um, it's quite a, uh, the area has, you know, in, in recent times, quite a lot of trouble and uh, quite a lot of gang activity. So the, the thing the girls on the estate were feeling that they, they didn't really have anywhere safe to go out and, and, and hang out. So there was a lot of a lot of work as to where those spaces could be, both indoor and outdoor. Um, so evolving diagrams. So there, there was a lot of green space on the estate. There's also a huge park here, and this is fairly well used. But the green space, the existing green space on the estate, are not well used. The residents don't feel safe going down into them. So it was all about how we could reconnect those, how we could improve the public realm, create some safe, friendly walking streets through, and then reoccupy all of the ground floors take away the parking where we could and reactivate it with new lobbies, uh, bike stores, workspace, re small retail. So this is the, the, the zone that we're, we're, it's already demolished. That's the pilot refurbishment. So we were looking at um, the red gridding is uh, both steelwork and carbon strapping to tie all of these 1960s panels back together again so they don't wobble. And then looking at winter garden strategies, uh, deck strategies, putting all of the badly laid services that had been pasted all over the building in the 90s, how they could be incorporated in, in a much more uh, sensible and elegant architectural way. Uh, examples here of the ground floors, giving us, again, pride and dignity into the entrances. And then the rehousing. So we didn't want to lose the character. We didn't want to go suddenly go up to 20 stories just because we could. So we tried to keep a tightly packed, uh, medium, medium high, high density, but medium, medium height, and integrate lots of different dwelling types, so from houses and maisonettes through to lots of apartments, but trying to cr create these little shoulders and steps that hark back a little bit to the old building, but also gave these, the family units, these big, big terraces and amenity space, and then a little bit of height here and the new health hub, um, and a, and a, um, a building here, which is sort of an early win where people could be rehoused as quickly as, as possible. So evolving. So this is um, just going, it's got detailed planning, uh, lots of support from residents, uh, despite all of the historical problems. And yeah, just going into construction drawings, uh, hopefully very soon, so we can get on site uh, with the first phases. Examples here again of you know, very, very, very simple layouts. We can't do fancy, fancy layouts everywhere sort of generous gallery access, you know, separate kitchen, dining, living room, three bedrooms, but double, always double aspect, both on the smaller and, and um, uh, bigger, bigger units. So examples of our sketching. So views, views through from, you know, trying to really embed quality and livability into every, every single space. Thank you. Probably run over by a few minutes. <laughs> oh, good. Thank you, Paul. Um, I, 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 wrote, I just wrote one thing in my book, which is like in all caps. This is how it's happening now. Can they think of one of the things you thought? Generous, quality, like dignified, it's amazing. So, um, Thank you for coming here to share yes. all those beautiful projects and thank you so much for being uh, inspired by it. Um, let's do a few questions. Uh, we won't keep you too long. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you all go in exactly 15 minutes. Maybe two at a time if... if uh, as, okay. okay, easy. Thanks for the talk, Paul. That was awesome. Wondering what level, um, to what extent do you advocate to make these projects happen as opposed to just receiving a brief and then fulfilling the brief? It sounds like you play quite a role in I would, pushing to on make a, the on projects On a personal happen. level, I would say 25% of my time is working closely with clients to try and lift ambition and push ideas forward. Um, probably... I'm very lucky. I've got an amazing studio manager and studio director who look after all of the practice running. So I 
don't have to do any of that. So then the rest of my time is wandering around the studio, chatting to design teams, designing, drawing, helping, you know, playing around with models, looking at some detailing, construction, a little bit of economics of, of how we make them the schemes work. But uh, I would say, yeah, with, with the writing and publishing as well, that's, a lot of that is about advocating for better public realm, public buildings, public housing. And, and what sort of uh, case would you make to a council that they should use a, a higher end kind of materiality? Yeah. How would almost, you make that case? It's, it's almost a no-brainer. We just say, look, we, every single project we're working on is, is only 40, 50, 60 years old. It's crazy. Buildings should last, you know, simple housing should last 300 years. It should be well designed, well specified, well built, well managed. And then it can age gracefully if it's, if it's using proper, solid, durable materials. There's no reason why a brick can't last 600 years, never mind 300. So, if, so from, a, from, you know, these are social landlords. It makes sense that their buildings, you know, if you, if you go to all the costs, and these are all 50 to 300 million pound projects, you don't want to spend 300 million pounds every 50 years when you don't have to. So this, it, um, that's the argument. It, it, most smart people get that. Um, some of the builders don't. And that's where, that's, that's where we have a rub with the construction industry who want to sometimes do slapdash. But that's, that's why we, we fight. So the advocacy is probably more with them. The, 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 well, the arguments with them. The, the, most of our clients get it. And, the, and they're, in the, they're in the sector to make, you know, change the world. They're not there to cheapen our buildings in the main. Yeah. There's a question just next to you, I think. Yeah, thanks so much, Paul. Um, you talked about a quite radical and sort of open process of engagement through design, planning, being really open about the financials. Project briefs and project timelines can often be really sort of restrictive in terms of genuine engagement. So I'm just wondering sort of what you've learned about the benefits of that, perhaps how you sell it in terms of greater certainty for the project and whether that's coming from the boroughs, being sort of more progressive boroughs in London or it's something you're positioning I think both, both those certainties definitely is, is, is aided by a thorough engagement process rather than just showing people pictures and saying it's going to look like this in five years time is proper a really deep discussion over many months and years um yes there are time pressures um but i would no normally from a if we get a competition brief or we're commissioned to work on something would be maybe a year to planning all the way through that you know, that 12 months, we're meeting at least fortnightly with the, res with the key residents and then maybe once a month with the wider resident group, which might be 50 to 350 people. And for me, it, it absolutely aids the process. They become, they're not obviously our client, but they are the people who are living in the building and they're the biggest advocates for design and quality and durability. So they are, they are you know, we are sort of in this oscillating Venn diagram of, of overlapping aims and ambitions, but um, yeah, they're absolutely front and center. Hopefully that came across, they're absolutely front and center of the, of the process. And for me, it leads to much more important, you know, satisfying work for us and the young architects in the room, in the, in the, in the studio. They are, you know, they want, they want to do that. They don't just want to build condo flats for, for developers. They want to do this because it's, you know, helping these residents. Hi, Paul, thank you. Um, I had a question, just a bit of a follow-up to the advocacy one, which is clearly at the front end and advocating for change and how value might be understood. Um, I'm interested in the back end of that too. So obviously there's a lot of research in your studio and how much post-occupancy or evaluation you might do or undertake to help substantiate the sorts of claims about the value and impact of those sorts of decisions? I think it's a, it's a very good question. The, the, the post-occupancy, so the, the oldest projects are probably now seven, the council projects, seven to eight years. So we've done at least two rounds of post-occupancy with those residents. And from a, informing me, informing the project architects is really, really important as to, because you know we all know, every designer in the room knows you can design something, how people actually live in it, it might be very different, especially in a, in a public housing context. So when we go back, it's everything from Paul or Ajia, the plug's in the wrong place, or the radio, why did you put the radiator there? And 
why do we put the radio? You know, sometimes eight years on, why do, why why was even why, why was there a radiator? Shouldn't even have a radiator. But the so we learn a lot from window positions. Is the window sill here? Is it here? Is it full high? All of you know the relationship between the kitchen, the dining room, the living room, the balcony. There's, so that on a on a day to day level, a lot of that. I think we we talk a lot about the public realm. Um, the streetscapes, the approach to the buildings, the lobbies, the experience of going from the lobby. So obviously, historically, some of that, those journeys were not great. So a lot about informing, um, you know, some of our architects won't have been on, to, on, lived in a lot of housing estates. So it's informing them. It's like what what works well, what didn't work well historically, what has worked well historically, and then how we can um, uh, design to make it better in the future. I think from a... Le, le, I think that they're slightly more resident focused. I won't call it anthropological, but it's it's more of a one to one with the residents. I think the clients are getting better at taking over you once the project is finished and going, this works really well from a public realm perspective. Materiality is great, but maybe there's some maintenance that could be refined on the next on the next project, or, or maybe some specification is is maybe just can be tweaked a little bit and. Hopefully that answers you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Um, just also following on from the conversation, in terms of the project you talked about with the mixed tenure uh, social affordable rents, I, I think you yeah. said. Yeah. How how has that turned out? I'm just interested because we often have issues with combining um, tenure. Type. It's a non a non issue. I mean, everyone is. I mean, London is very uh, mixed anyway. Partly because of the Luftwaffe and partly because of the um, uh, 50s and 60s planning. The whole areas of Victorian London were levelled. Uh, the bits the Germans missed were then levelled by the planners in the 50s and 60s. So the, you end up with these outcrops of big housing estates. So people are just used to living next to public housing in every, even, you know, where the Beckhams live in Holland Park, over the road there's a massive housing estate. It's just, it's just normal. Um, so in a in a in a all of the projects already mixed tenure in a way because of right to buy people bought their flats some of those have been traded over the last thirty years so there'll be you know lots of students living in the estate so it's it's that so that's fairly normalised um, but on a so we we try and do it on a block by block or core by core so outwardly there's no difference in the lobbies there's no difference the lifts are the same the kitchen worktops might be a bit you know fancier in the market sale building. But the, the social is just really well specified, solid. The key worker maybe has a you know maybe slightly different wooden floors, um, and the market sale depending on where it is. If it's in, in Hoxton's, maybe a little bit more shishi than in Harringay. Um, right to buy still exist. Um, officially, yes, but the councils are trying to make it much harder for people to to cash out. Um, so you see, it's had a fifty year. Very checkered history, and it's you know obviously doesn't help uh, supply public housing. Council? Yes, uh, it's, it, these are all council-led projects. They own the land. They will almost no council will sell the land. So even on the private blocks, it'll be a two fifty year lease. Um, so eventually they will get it. They they think I mean they don't think two fifty years, but they they think long term. They the, our best councils have a fifteen to twenty five year sort of timeline of their housing program. Unfortunately, the funding isn't a 25 year funding timeline. It's a five year. That, that's, uh, that's sometimes where, it, where there's a, a clash. There's a, a, an arm at the back I can see as well. Thanks, Paul, for your presentation. Um, my question is related to your refer refurbishment uh, work. Um, I'm just interested to what level of intervention do you find you need to go to to bring uh, dwellings that were constructed some years ago up to a standard that people are satisfied with today. Um, are you going back to like a skeleton of the building or is it just sort of minimal tweaks that you need to do? It's I mean, probably 40% of the new work in the studio is now refurbishment or refurbishment with some new build, but there's a, a huge, because a lot of the bad slash toxic buildings were demolished in the 90s, early 2000s. So now the ones that are left are actually, apart from in Broadwater, generally structurally sound so then it's we you know the councils can't afford to knock it all down and re rebuild it so 
then for refurbishment, obviously the carbon debate has risen over the last five to 10 years. Um, so depending on the budget and the level of ambition, the councils are looking at um, uh, so essentially passive house for retrofit, um, obviously a very different climate to here, um, but it's essentially lots of insulation, triple glazing, uh, new uh, mechanical ventilation to prevent mold. So in order to do that, you have to take almost everything out and then redo. And it's about 55 to 65% of the cost of new build. So it's, um, I, I remember about 10 years ago, somebody said, oh, you can refurbish for 25,000 pounds a flat. You definitely can't, not, not, not up to that spec level. Because obviously, um, you know, new lifts, new services, you know, they're at, at 60 years, obviously a lot of those things do need refreshing. There's a big cost to doing that. Um, the, the complexity is then how you move the residents out for three months, six months, um, if, if it's a deep refurbishment, um, or if it's, you know, adding on balconies or winter gardens or just doing light touch, then where, where can they move out for a week into a flat on the estate and then come back when it's ready? But yeah, we're, it's, it's deep, deep refurb and retrofit. Hi, Paul. Thank you. Um, you spoke a little bit about discussions with the residents in some of these projects. I was just wondering what some of the most key or most influential concerns and discussions that you had with the residences were in some of these projects and how you sort of went about accommodating for a wide variety of different people. I think initially the, the, the first big concern is always, are we coming back? Uh, so there's a, a fear, has a historical fear of displacement. There were some bad examples 15 or 20 years ago where residents were just sort of bust off somewhere else and never came back, um, which was obviously exactly how you don't do it. Um, luckily, non, not for any of our clients and definitely not on any, any of our jobs. But so displacement is, is num number one, uh, less so nowadays, but at the beginning of you know, 15 years ago, parking was a massive issue. If you're going to intensify, if you're going to build on the car park, where do I park my car? Again, that is with all of our schemes now are a zero parking in central London. Uh, so that's less of an issue. I think um, they've been, some of the residents have been living in very uh, nice 1960s planned um, flats. So they're quite generous. Um, so all of our projects, the council added add 10%. So there's an amazing, I didn't talk about it in the interim context, but an incredible document called the in 1946, I think, the Parker Morris Standards, which set out all of the regulations for UK housing. It's a great document for anyone, uh, any uh, housing historians in the room. Um, so a lot of the estates were built on Parker Morris, and in order for the modern living, space standards, um, size of furniture, and everything else, it all got a bit bigger. Uh, we're adding ten a minimum of ten percent to those standards. So that's another thing. It's like the, obviously a lot of residents. Are very happy with deep retrofit and refurbishment and all residents are very happy with new build but they don't want the new build to be smaller than their last flat so that's probably the the next most important thing and most most like brick as well so that's luckily that chimes well with our interests so we're, we don't have to talk about materiality too much um hi thank you for your presentation um i think you said you worked for 1.5 years and then started your practice and i guess i was curious firstly um, were you always intending to go into a practice that focused on social housing? And then how did you manage to kind of sustain and grow the practice, I guess, financially and employees and everything when you had a project? A good question. I'll try and, I'll try and answer that in one minute. Um, I, I was always interested in doing public and civic work, def definitely. Social housing wasn't really a thing um, nearly 30 years ago. Um, obviously, all of the councils have been defunded and no one was building truly afford social and affordable housing. So there was a bit of a flaw in my, my plan. Um, but I thought I was going to go off and win a museum or an opera house somewhere or a big library somewhere else. Um, we got very close. It didn't quite happen. Um, so in the in intervening years, um, probably three or four years, I was doing a lot of teaching. Um, I know you shouldn't sponsor the office for teaching, but I did naughtily. Uh, so I was teaching two or three days a week in, in some of the London schools doing lots of um, unit work and then guest tutoring and things. Um, so that was keeping me fairly busy. Um, and then 
working frantically on every idea, every um, housing competition dotted around every other competition, and one or two little private jobs in the early years. And then a housing association um, interviewed us. Uh, it's before com a comp formal competition, so they were allowed just to, oh, you, you know, who are those kids over there that are interested in housing? And we were called in, and um, that led to it. That was a really, really interesting career break. So that was suddenly then that was, you know, generating fees. We could employ more people. Um, I would say, I mean, we lived at MasterCard were probably our biggest sponsor for the first, you know, five or six years of the the office it was it was very it wasn't really a, it was a marginal business i would say um but we we just about scraped through would i do it again I'm not sure it was it was a, it was a, it got a bit you know there was a few tense tense moments uh, i think a lot of practices are do cross subsidize public work with private work um a lot of practices are now subsidizing all work with saudi arabia which i don't really subscribe to um so um the um, yeah, I mean, it's, it was a it was a very different form of practice um, uh, back then. Now it's slightly more more structured and uh, hopefully more um, sensible financially. We, we 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 try and always charge a proper fee so we can do a proper proper job and especially do enough the resident engagement and enough design process to make it worthwhile. Yes, as well. well I in public, it's not like it might be hard, but you can do it. I yeah. think we should take inspiration from that. Yes. You know, first few years of scrambling and make it work. Um, thank you for your great questions to finish it off. And, and a big thank you to Paul Caracuzzi. Thank you. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Have fun. Thank you.